Hi there folks and welcome to this episode of Michael's Backyard Marina. I'm going to make sure this is recording because you don't know how many times silly ass me has started talking to the camera and be talking for five minutes and realize it's not even recorded. That's how much I like to listen to myself talk I guess because a few of you have left comments to that nature which is fine. Leave all the comments you want. Anyway, welcome to this episode of Michael's Backyard Marina. Rena, I've got an interesting one for you today. This one is about the 1969 20-horse Johnson that I put on the 1969 Sea Nymph 14-foot aluminum boat. Now keep in mind that boat, motor, trailer, full tank of gas with six gallons of fuel in it, battery, a casting deck on it, weighs 660 pounds going across the scale. It's pretty lightweight. Anyway, we, that's my boat. As you guys have seen, have been following me for a minute. Uh, I throw all these boats on the back of that old nymph and see what she'll do, whether I put an Evinrude, a Johnson, or a Mercury behind her. Anyway, I'm out there, get it loaded into the water, get ready to take her off across the lake, and I take off across the lake. And my sons follow me in the banana. We took two boats to the water that day, and you'll see an upcoming video pretty soon. I'm going to have some fun. We did a little 14-foot uh, banana versus sea nymph drag racing. We're going to have some fun with that one. And uh, I'm take off to head across the lake. And normally, you know, when I test a motor out, I've got a, a lake that I go to. And to go from the beach area where we launch all the way to the dam and back, and I think it's a, closing in on, uh, I think it's uh, 18, 17 or 18 miles round trip. And I figure if a boat motor can take me 18 miles round trip and not give me any trouble and I'm I'm full throttle a lot of the way I'm idling part of the way because there's a no wake zone it's about a shoot feels like it's a half mile long probably only a quarter mile anyway as long as it all does that all that stuff really well then I feel okay selling the motor because I feel like I've got a pretty solid one well let me tell you what happened with this guy run like a top nail the throttle right out of the gate 22 miles an hour boom up on plane and she's going and running like a top. Get about a half a mile, three quarters of a mile away from the boat ramp, and she starts slowing down. And it's going from 22, and it's like down to 16 miles an hour, and then up to 17, 18, down to 16, and up to 17, 18. Doesn't get back to 22 again. And then it just starts hanging out at 16. I'm like, what's weird? I throttle off. My son pulls up next to me in the banana, and he's like, what's going on? I said, I'm not doing that up and down with the speed because he's just keeping pace behind me. He goes, oh, I thought you were just throttling up and down. I'm like, no, it's doing it all by itself. I think we got a fuel delivery issue or something like that. Well, lo and behold, it does it on and off, on and off for the next like half mile or mile, I think it was. Now, most people would go, get that thing back to the ramp and get it up on the trailer. Well, I wasn't too worried. I got the old banana. It can tow me back to the dock and we can load it up and be done with that boat for the day. Anyway, so it does it for a little bit more and a little bit more. And I'm like, man, this is weird. So I thought I have this bronze prop for it. And I'm, right now I'm running the aluminum prop at that moment. I'm like, well, I'm going to try this bronze prop because every time I slowed down to an idle for a minute and then took off again, she'd get up to 22 miles an hour and then it'd start doing it again on and off, on and off. It's really weird. Um, motor's running fantastic not missing a beat. So I thought, well, we'll pull over to a little beach area, kick the motor up out of the water, pull the old bronze prop out and get ready to install it. And I'm spinning the prop over and it's like, wow, that thing's spinning tight, spinning real tight. I'm like, that's not right. And it started all adding it up in my head and uh, two plus two came out to 3.4795. And I'm like, light bulb goes off. I'm going to show you what I discovered and what all I put together and, and I'm going to tell you what was happening. Now you guys might be able to see that. I think it's showing up. It's hard to see in the little picture. But this is the oil that came out of the gearbox. There was no water in it whatsoever. But doesn't it look like I've been panning for gold? Can you see all the goldy shiny stuff in there? <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> That's bad. I didn't notice it when I was changing it out. I just drained it pumped it full, slid this out of the way, and 
put you know put my new Amsoil gear oil in there and went about my merry way. So as soon as all that happened, I'm like, oh shoot, we got a bad gearbox. We got a bearing going bad or something. There shouldn't have been that much metal in there. And once I spun that over and felt it was tight, I'm like, e, we're about ready to seize up. <laughs> That's not good at all, right? Well, I went ahead and stuck the prop on it anyway. I thought, well, I'm going to try it a couple more times and just head back toward the dock. And then if it does seize up, it's just going to kill the motor. Uh, gearbox is probably already kind of pooping out on me anyway. And just see what this other prop will do. Well, put this other prop on it. And cause, because I, when I was putting it on there, I spun it frontwards and backwards on there. And I don't know if it's because I was tipped at an angle that uh, some oil got in where it wasn't getting in possibly. And it freed up a little bit, but it still got a little bit of drag. And I'm like, eh, it's still not good. It should be just, you know, feel like it's smooth, like it's rolling, rolling on a, you know, like it's rolling on a bearing. Well, I put it on there and lo and behold, nailed the throttle 22 miles an hour. And I'm holding it wide open thinking, eh, it's going to start slowing down again. The gearbox is going to start seizing on me some more. It didn't. I don't know why it didn't, but it didn't. So I get about halfway back to the dock and I told my son, I'm like, we're heading back to the dam. I said, I'm going to run it through she breaks. If it ain't broke, fix it till it is, right? Well, I get, uh, we head back toward the dam. We're making the whole journey, the whole 17, 18 miles round trip with it. It never does it again. It runs 22 miles an hour the whole way there and the whole way back. So we got out there and we had some fun drag racing with it. What I call drag racing, you know, the banana. So it's a 1,260 pound total boat and trailer set up just for weight comparisons. The banana with a 35 horse and the sea nymph for the 20 horse Sick, give this the banana's given up 600 pounds of weight and only get and but has 15 more horsepower. Well, so what I do, we go, we hang drones up in the air and we drag race. And this, we do this back and forth between the drones several times. And then it's like, okay, we landed the drones on the boats and then took our went on our merry way. This thing went all the way to the dam and all the way back, didn't act weird again. I get it back on the trailer and the prop still. You can tell it has tension on it. It has drag. It should be free flow and it's not. So guess what we're going to do here? We're going to go ahead and pull this gearbox apart and I'm going to show you how to pull a gearbox apart and how we're going to fix this little problem and get this old 69 back on the water running like a top. Cause it's, it's sad when I got a great, a great power head and I got a gearbox that's a little bit toasty, but Anyway, let's jump in and start taking this thing apart and we'll drain this oil out of here first because I'm kind of curious to see what this really clean oil, new oil I put in looks like. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to drain it into a glass jar so I can see everything that went on with the new oil. And uh, then we'll take it apart and look at the pieces inside. I'm pretty sure what I've got is a, bron a bronze bushing that has started uh, wearing on the shaft or, or the shafts were in the bearing vice versa chances are we're going to have a problem part the good news is i have several of these gearboxes in my fleet of parts here so this thing will be back on the water again and we'll see how it does next go around so without further ado let's jump in and start pulling this thing apart i'm curious to see what's inside all right like i said we're gonna i'm gonna go ahead and drain this gearbox oil here and see what we can see. Like I showed you what was in the previous oil change, which is absolutely scary, horrific. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this top plug out. Okay, I got the top plug out. We're recording. Yeah, I got the top plug out. I've got a glass jar here. I'm gonna go ahead and drain this. See if there's, wow. Wow, look at that. <laughs> that oil is black. Oh, it smells terrible. Wowzer. All right, guys, since we saw what condition this is in, where the oil came out pretty black, we're going to go ahead and pull the prop off, and we're going to get after splitting this case. And uh, I'm going to show you real quick the comparison on the old oil. 
or not the old oil, the new oil with this little run I did, about an 18 mile run, right here in a clear, that's a clear jar, believe it or not, ball canning jar. That's the oil that came out of it, I caught it all. And this is the color, the Sam's oil oil, of what it was when it went in. This is 18 miles, 18 to 20 miles of, of uh, boating on the reservoir, and <laughs> that's what happened. We definitely got something uh, not happy inside. And I honestly believe if it's anything other than Amsoil, and I'm not sponsored by them, but if you're listening to Amsoil, you can send me stuff um, that I'm pretty sure this gearbox would have seized up solid. No, pres no question in my mind. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna attempt to split this thing open now that we've seen how sorry that gear oil looked. And looking at these screws, these have been touched before. You can see where uh, somebody used not maybe the best screwdriver to take it apart. And I'm also going to get a biggest one I got here that'll fit. I don't know if the giant big one's going to go. Oh yeah, it fits. Oh, that broke loose. Thought I might have to use my impact driver, but we'll see. They're all breaking loose, which is good. And as you guys saw, that oil was black. Oh, so black. It smells so bad. But... There was no water in it. Oh, that one was tight. Well, they all came loose. That's good. Now, my understanding is I want to take this screw out. Typically, you don't want to mess with this one unless you're taking it apart because this is where I think there's a pivot for the, I don't know if it's the shift paw or shift dog or the actual technical name. And I'll be completely honest with you folks, I've never had a gearbox like this one apart before. So you and I are learning together. I'm never too proud to say, I ain't never done that before. Yeah, that's going to be a little impact driver action there. And if you guys do not have one of these impact drivers, I'll leave a link in the description below to show you exactly what I'm using. Now, I've had this one for a lot of years. But the cool part about them is they'll come with several different, si several different sizes of bits. You find one that fits. Then you're going to turn this in the direction that you want it to go, and then you're going to give it a smack. Boom, yeah, there we go, we got it loose. That would have been virtually impossible to do without an impact driver. And I probably will stick a new screw in here just because this Phillips is kind of toast now. But yeah, that's a pin, it's a, a pivot pin here. So that one, you have to buy that from an OEM or I'm gonna have to find it out of another unit that has a, that this hasn't been destroyed or turn this into a big slot and do something like that, which I could, that way I could reuse it. We'll decide that when we get there. In this position, I think now, we're gonna go ahead and finish backing off these other two screws. And we'll see if we can separate it. And if I discover anything that I screwed up on, I'm gonna share that with you. Because I don't want you to make the same mistakes I'm making, if I make them. Now, first thing you wanna do is not go wailing on this. Whoops, <laughs> well that came apart pretty easy. How easy was that? Because I've seen some of these come apart pretty darn tight. Now you can see where that pivot pin was right there. That goes right through there. Boy, that's some black gunky stuff in there. And there's a, there is an O-ring in here that seals this face off. And you'll have to replace that. Boy, you can certainly see how, how dirty and black this thing was. Woo! And we're going to pull it apart and examine each piece. And we'll see if we can discover what the culprit is to all this wear. Yeah, that's not stuck in there real tight. Looks like all this, your shift shaft that's sticking out the bottom here, there's looks like a little, there's a little cotter pin on this side. So we're gonna undo that cotter pin. Man, that smells so bad with that nasty oil. While I straighten out that cotter pin, and it's just a tiny guy, so it doesn't take a lot of effort. I was sitting in the house there editing videos, and I thought, man, I gotta know what's going on with this thing. Because it's 11 o'clock at night right now. It was just bugging me. I said, I got to get out there. I got to get this part. So I want to get it out there to let people know what happened here. Because this is the first gearbox I had that's, that was uh, smoked, basically. And obviously there's, you know, I've had really good luck with all the oil I put in these things. And I'm confident it wasn't the oil. I think there, obviously, it was before I got to it. Whatever transpired and happened, happened because... Just like I showed you at the beginning of the video. Oh, there we go. Got that little cotter pin out. I kind of lay this stuff up out in the order I take it apart. So yeah, we got that. 
Looks like that little shifter paw there comes right off. And, and there again, nothing was wrong forward and reverse, and that paw seems like it fits tight down in the groove, which is great. Keep in mind, everything we saw in that pan was gold. And guess where that piece of gold is? It's right here. So this should lift, be able to sneak that right out of there, just like that. And the faces of these gears look pretty good. Oh, that comes right off. There are, there are a lot of lines on that diameter right there. Just gonna kind of pull this apart here piece by piece for you. Just the amount of black sludge that's in here is impressive. I'm not sure if there's supposed to be grooves on this face. They look like they're on purpose. The shift dog looks pretty good. And this part of the shaft looks pretty clean. Now the other thing I've got here, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but right around this hole, where the pin has actually mushroomed and raised this up where I can't slide this off. So I'm gonna have to file this down in order to get that to slide off like I want it to. I won't bore you with that action. Alrighty, I got that filed off behind the scenes and it slips right off nice and easy. And I'm feeling the if there's any play in these bearings here and that bearing bushing feels really nice reverse gear comes off of here or i don't know if i'm not sure i'm calling this the right first you know forward or reverse gear but that's what everything just feels so smooth and good with that washer right in here what feels the tightest right now is this bearing right here on this Pretty sure that's where my tightness is coming from. That just feels like that's got... Now this has definitely got some wear in it. And I can definitely feel... You get that away from that face. And there's a lot of wiggle there. So all that bronze has been coming out of the inside of this guy. Because the gear looks really good. And these do have little pins down in here. As you can see, this has a groove in it, and that groove would be sitting. Haha. <laughs> and that could be part of the problem, too. Yep, that's where it all came from. Haha, <laughs> now we're getting to the root of it, folks. This particular bearing <laughs> should not have a groove around the outside. There's a pin down here, and it doesn't stick up. Quite as high as I think it should, but what's happening is look at that. There's our culprit right there. Is this bushing was spinning. And it's allowing things to be a little more bind up than it should be, or bound up than it should be. Pinion gear looks really good down in here. So this bushing's just it's toast. And that pin that's in here. I just feel that's not sticking up as far as it should be because it's it's got like a chamfer on top. I'm going to get you in here close. Why do I have this camera that can do really fancy close stuff if I'm not going to show it to you? Do you guys see that pin right there? That thing is barely sticking up as a bump. Now this might be hard to see, but there's a groove. There's a groove down this bushing that's supposed to sit on that pin to keep it from spinning around. Now. As you can see, if I put it not all the way back where it's going to ride, that it'll go right down in there and hold. But apparently something had a little too much friction and it let that bushing just spin and it cut a perfect little groove right around there. And that's where all that bronze came from. Now I know where all the metal fleet came from. Yeah, and you can see how the inside of this bushing, that inside of that bushing is cooked. So there's a lot of bad... Bad rubbing going on there, but the bush, the bushing's soft. It's bronze. I'm pretty sure it'll be bronze. And the gear is hard, and it's got some grooves on it. Definitely shouldn't. Yeah, and you can see this bushing here has grooves on it, where it's been a lot of wear been going on between these two pieces. So I'm going to have to find me a, a good bushing and a good gear. There's our culprits right there. That's the problem. Plus, I, I'm pretty sure that pen should be sticking out further than it is. No doubt in my mind.
All right, folks, this next section I'm going to go over is going to be a little bit detailed, but I think it's important because the devil's in the details when it comes to fixing things. Um, as you saw, this pin had cut a groove around the bearing because it had grabbed and spun and all that kind of fun stuff. Now, this doesn't have any roller bearings. This is, has, this has bushings for bearings. And the idea behind a bushing for a bearing is it runs on a film of oil. It has to have uh, lubrication between the bearing and the shaft. Otherwise, heat, friction, galling, seizure. Okay? Uh, I pulled three of these apart because I saw how this bearing had spun. And I'm going to go back through it one more time. Uh, this bearing had spun on the, I grabbed and spun inside the housing. There's supposed to be, and there is a little dowel pin, a roll pin, I guess you'd call this one, a pin that is in the housing that's supposed to sit into the groove to prevent spinning. Well, as you saw in this one, and I'll show you again, it had spun and cut a groove around it. I think there's a, now I don't want to call it an engineering flaw or a manufacturing flaw, because it could be either. Now I work, I've been in the machining industry, manufacturing industry, tool and die, tool maker myself, uh, and something just doesn't seem quite right. Something is amiss here, and I'll show you what it is. Let's jump in, and I'll show, you the, show it to you right now. Show you what I found, show you the flaw, show you how it should go back together, and show you the modification that I'm gonna make, and cross my fingers, it should be fine. And the reason I say that is some people might cringe at what I'm about to do, and some people go, heck yeah, that's a good fix. So I'll, I'll leave you guys to decide. I'm not the judge and jury on this. Uh, also, if anybody's had ex any other experience with these typical gearboxes, this style of gearbox, share your thoughts, share your tips with the rest of us in the comments. Uh, it is very helpful. I've learned a lot from you guys' comments. Uh, a lot of times I'll respond to you, thanks for the tip. Good tips or bad tips, I thank you for the tip because Everybody needs to listen to other people and make their own conclusions as to what is right or wrong. Anyway, let's take a quick look at this and then I'm gonna start, then I'm gonna do my modification. I'm gonna clean it up and I'm gonna put it back together. And hopefully it goes back on the boat and I'm back on the water possibly tomorrow to make another 18 mile run with this thing. And then we'll see if the oil stays clear versus turns black like this one did. So that'll tell me whether it's right or wrong. And you guys may or may not know this because, you know, I buy these motors. Typically these motors aren't anybody else's or mine. So if I'm wasting my time, my effort, it's my money. I'm not wasting a customer's money. When I learn new things, I'm learning it with my money. So this is one that I'll, and I only sell these motors when I know that I can do exactly what I'm going to do with this one. I, I fix them, get a run in, put them on the back of the boat, make about an 18 mile run. I do then again, change the gear oil because I want to see what things are looking like there because besides the power head running properly, the gearbox is transmitting the power to the water under severe load. Uh, you got that 20 horsepower, that 10 horsepower going through a 90 degree gearbox and you got a prop. And you don't think about that, but uh, these engines are under a load all the time. They don't get to coast. Because even if you're idling, it's still under a load. Now your car, Going up a hill, down a hill, up a hill, down a hill. Motorcycle, they're under intermittent loads. So they're not full load. You take this and hold the flower wide open for 18 miles. This thing is like taking your car and going up a 45 degree grade or steeper and just holding the pedal to the floor and making it go up that hill. It puts a severe load on things. So just that paints a mental picture, I hope, and lets you know what these things are subject to. All boat motors are subject to this kind of load because water doesn't coast <laughs> you get me unless you're you know traveling down river and the river flows at three miles an hour and you're going three miles an hour that's the closest you'll get to coasting in a boat anyway don't know if you ever thought of it that way but let's jump in here and take a quick look now one of the things i do enjoy about my new camera is i can get you up close and in detail now as i've said before this is the this is the bearing bushing combination this is the gear and the bushing that rides down in this pocket right here there are no thrust bearings, there are no roller bearings. This is strictly oil and oil contact for this thing to move with all the load against it from the pinion gear. Down in here, and I'm hoping I can see this, let's see. Down in here, 
is a little hard, I'm assuming it's a hardened little dowel pin or roll pin or whatever, that is supposed to lock into a groove right here on this bushing. Now this thing has been a part, I've got this one off of, a, this is a gear and bearing that's in good shape according to the wear inside and all that fun stuff. It might not look pretty, but it measures and checks out really well. But you can see that it was also put together multiple times because all three gearboxes I took apart have silicone, blue goo, all kinds of other stuff along with the O-ring. You can see right here the dent right there and a dent right there where somebody didn't put this back together properly. And that's probably what, honestly, I hate to say it, saved its life because it couldn't spin. It had a pop more positive lock than this pin did here sticking up. And I'm gonna try to measure it. I don't know if I'll get, I probably won't be able to get a great measurement on it because it is in a radius and whatnot. But even measuring with the radius, that's the radius of the bearing and measuring down to that pin, it's only about 15 thousandths proud. 1 64th of an inch, close to 1 64th. And the groove, the groove measures about 44 thousandths deep. So this thing could be sticking up 30 thousandths more proud than it is and not interfere with the performance of the bearing. Now I did check, I did take apart three of these gearboxes, like I said, and I'll show you each one. Here's another one, same kind of situation, same kind of, of uh, not sticking up very far. Here's the third one, same situation, not sticking up very far. And that's why I'm calling it, and I, I don't wanna say this too much, I'm not trying to bash or why something is a certain way but I just feel that during the machining of this particular piece this casting and the design of that hole and the depth of that pin that it's possibly driven down and bottomed out which is fine which is the way it should be uh, there is no access to get it back out it's just it's in there it's in there nothing you can do about it but to allow the tolerances that are involved between this particular bushing and this pin protrusion to allow it to have, you know, if it's 44 thousandths worth of groove depth, have that groove depth be plus or minus five thousandths and then this pin protrusion be plus or minus five thousandths and at least, at least get, you know, 20, 25 to honestly, you could get 30 thousandths worth of protrusion sticking out here and not interfere with the performance of that bearing, you know, by it sticking up there and causing a crushing situation. Here's my plan. I bought, now these are tension pins, spring tension pins. Not the perfect thing to use for this situation, but it's better than what's there. And yes, I could order some uh, actual dowel pins and put them down in here. But what I like about the spring tension pin is if I put it in in the proper direction, if there's any pressure one way or the other rotationally, it won't collapse. So if I put it so that the split is in the direction of the rotation, it won't actually help it collapse if it was to try to spin and then lose. But the other thing I've got going for me here is this is trapped. This is completely trapped in here. It can't come out. So it's gonna, it's gonna act like a, let's just call it a doorstop for the bearing. And there's plenty of casting left here, which is what I really do appreciate, that will allow me to drill this down and install this pin and then install the, this actually good bushing in place and prevent it from rotating. Another little feature that somebody I'm sure didn't recognize when they put this one back together due to the dents that are not in line with the groove is that 180 of this groove is a mark. There's a mark right there and so that's supposed to help you install it. When you put it together, this mark should be straight up and down. Once you get this installed straight up and down, now you can't rotate. See, I can make that thing pop right out, but you can, you can make sure you get it installed in the right orientation so that it doesn't cause you a problem. Now, with all that verbiage, I'm gonna get my little eighth inch drill bit out. I'm gonna drill a hole straight down in here, but actually what I'm gonna do first, I'm gonna do a little center punch mark so it's in line with that pin. And then I'm also gonna do a smaller than 1 8 inch drill bit. I'm gonna drill that in there and then I will drill it out to an eighth inch so the tension pin fits actually really pretty good is my goal. And then I'll install the tension pin, flush all the debris, de the debris that I created in here out. I'm also gonna protect it from as much debris as I can just so I don't have to flush as much out. And now with my 
3 30 seconds drill bit i'm going to carefully drill a hole straight down perpendicular now this is all just a good eyeball job guys and this material is very soft Now that I have that 3.30 seconds drill in there, I'm going to go back in here with my eighth inch drill and open it up. That way I'll ensure better sizing because due to just less wiggling while I'm drilling. There we go. This that easy. Okay, now I've got the hole drilled out. Looks really good. As you can see, I don't know if you can see this, but this dial pin, you know this hole, this slot here is about 100 and, well, let me measure it. It's about 160 thousandths wide. This, this pin's only about an eighth inch wide. Or is an eighth inch wide. The one that's in there is about 110. So there is some wiggle room. So there is some room margin for error. Now, the other thing I want to show you is I took this over to the belt center and I ground this off so that it was flat. I wanted a flat sharp edge here just to get as much height because on these other ends of these pins they are they've got a little chamfers radius whatever you want to call it formed into them. I'm putting this in in a fashion that the slot is perpendicular to the shaft. Now I'm going to hold this carefully. I'm going to see if I can get in here without blocking the camera shot. Get her to tap down in there started. So it was very easy to start. And I'll take a little pin punch here and drive it on down. Because keep in mind now, if you drop this down, you tap this down too far, it's not coming back up and there's no way to retrieve it. So slow and steady wins the race here. I'm just gonna take my caliper, kind of go down in here and get me a measurement from the top of the pin to the bottom. I'm at 65 right there. I know I've got 45 thousandths worth of room. And here's where we're just going to sneak up on it. Now that's right at 45. I don't want it to be just dead flush. Now the other nice thing is because it is a tension pin and when I tighten things down, that bearing may be stiff enough to push it down right where it needs to be but I don't want to put that kind of pressure on the bearing and cause a high spot. Right there is 40 thousandths proud. Now I'm just going to test fit this in here. Here again, I got the notch up and I'm looking at the texture of this bronze bushing and this looks like an oil light bronze. And that feels like that's going right down where it belongs. Now when I rock this back and forth, I can, I can actually hit, feel it hitting on that stop and I can go halfway between the play right now. I'm just going to give it just a little love tap here. Not doing any damage to the bearing. But yeah, that sits down there. It rocks and stops. I think that'll play. It rocks very tight now. So we've got that. In my opinion, that's a, that's a better fix than what was there. I can actually feel it in place. This one here, I could actually, it had a radius on both sides on the original pin. I did not like that. All that's left to do now, in my opinion, is let's clean this thing back up, get all these faces prepped, and we can do some reassembly. Now, something I'm doing to prep this, and you guys are going to, may think I'm nuts here, but you know, around the outside of these things, they get a little beat up, banged up, they hit rocks, they hit different things. And I can see raised areas here, because I can take my file, and this is a, in a situation with a, this is a, just an old mill file here. I can right hand push and it'll cut. Or you put the handle left hand pull, it'll cut. It's called draw filing. And I can come through here just like I'm doing right now. And I can see, I'm not removing anything from material to speak of, but I can see the high spots. I can see the shiny high spots around here from these dents. Well, I don't want that, those dents. Now, granted, both pieces are dented a little bit, but I don't want that to prevent, uh, create a gap that shouldn't be there as I put it back together, which can cause a leak. So here again, I'm just, I'm not trying to get this thing perfectly flat, but I'm taking off the highs. 
because I can still see the original machining marks on this surface. And now I'm pretty happy with that surface. That's a much better surface to work with. Alrighty, we got all the parts here all cleaned up nice and pretty, laid out on my nice clean cloth. I'm going to use some assembly lube. Um, you could just cover this stuff in uh, just your regular lube that's going to be used in the gearbox. That would be fine too. Uh, I just prefer to use some assembly lube here. And uh, just give it a little more of a of a chance. This way I know none of this areas here are going together dry. That's the most important thing. So we got that bearing and bushing put in place. We got our little shifter dog here. We're going to put some grease all over the splines. Got the other bearing and gear here. Now there is a hole right here that will line up on some pins in the housing. So this groove being down and that bushing being down lining up on that pin. This pin sticks up very proud. Almost impossible to put together without that being right. We've got a new O-ring here we're going to put on. All right, we're ready to set this assembly back in the back in the housing. So we'll kind of lift this little shift shaft up out of the way a little bit. And now this groove here is going to go straight down so I can see this notch is straight up. And then this hole right here it's going to go and drop right down over that other pin. It should just fall right in there, I'm hoping. There, just like that. See how that moved on me? There we go. Now that spins freely. We're all running inside of grease right now. I'm not worried about putting grease on these gear teeth because they're going to be, when I'm all said and done, they're going to be just floating in oil anyway. This whole housing is filled with oil. One thing I will put a big glob of grease on is for the shifter fork. And there again on the, the other pieces I'm not too worried about because by the time I fill it with oil it'll be just swimming in oil. Now we'll install our little pin. Our little baby cotter pin. Stuff that back in there. With all that in there, that should uh... So once you put your cross pin in here, that'll allow you to pivot. Let's see if I can show you kind of... That's what it's doing inside the housing when it pivots here. Forward reverse type of thing going on action. Pretty, pretty easy peasy, right? It sits right there in the middle for neutral. Like I said, once that pivot pin's trapped in there, this thing's just floating. Well, it feels like it should be working pretty slick, pretty slick, pretty slick, pretty slick. I'll get that somewhere in that vicinity right there. Now, I've cleaned everything off with brake clean already. But now that I've had my hands around here, I'm going to go ahead and just wipe this down one more time. If you guys got other suggestions of how to do this, uh, please feel free to share them. But I'm going to show you what I'm going to do, what I feel is right. All right, folks, if you've watched me for a minute on my videos, I like to let the gasket do the gasket's job. But in this case, I don't have a new piece of O-ring. And the cool part is this O-ring still sticks up proud enough to seal it, I feel. But I bought some of this Permatex Gear Oil Gasket Maker Specialized Formula. Now, the Specialized Formula is for the anti-slip friction enhancer type thing for the posi rear ends and whatnot so but it is designed for gear oil so i figured i'm kind of safe going that route i use gear oil or gasket sealer like this very sparingly because i don't want it to be smeared everywhere and hanging out everywhere looking like a total butthole job so i'm going to just put a fine amount 
around here that's just enough to help this gasket out. This stuff is stiff, my goodness. Because right here is the biggest place where it could leak easily, is right where the gasket starts and stops, right? So we're gonna put a little bit of extra there. We're not getting nutty with it. Dang it, dropped one of my screws. I'm pretty happy with that. Now as I'm putting this back on here, I'm just carefully gonna, there's nothing that really locates it, so to speak, other than the actual bearing surfaces themselves. I got that started in there. We'll go ahead and give it a few turns. Now we got our shifter in place. We'll go ahead and uh, now I'm going to put a little bit of a dab of this stuff around the top of each screw head because that's about the only other place it could leak water in or oil out. Now I'm just getting them all started and I'm starting to pull it down just a little bit. I'm not getting nutty with it yet. Now you guys witnessed how little I put on there. Look at that, I had just a little bit of squeeze out on both sides. That just goes to show you there's, you know, there's not a lot of uh, that sealant that's needed. There we go, let's tighten back down, look at that. Still moves freely, gotta like that. We'll be ready to stick this back on the boat. A little bit around this little shift shaft pin here. Well, that's as simple as it gets. Now I'll let this, uh, because I did put some gasket maker on there and just, for precautionary measures, I'm gonna let that dry overnight, set up overnight. I'll put uh, gear oil in it in the morning, install this back on the outboard, and we'll go from there. All right, folks, well, that's all there is to it, to put in, taking this type of gearbox apart and putting it back together. I showed you some of the key components, a couple of the features to look for. Uh, the seals on this particular uh, Gearbox were good, so I was able to reuse the seals, the outboard seals. Uh, but the, as you saw, uh, I cleaned it all up, made that one little, I think a very important modification to keep that bearing from possibly spinning again or working back and forth or causing some, doing something that it's not supposed to be doing. Because what'll happen if that actually spins in there? Now, granted, if you've got enough friction in there that causes that bearing to spin, chances are, you haven't changed your gear oil often enough and you've just smoked your gearbox anyway. Uh, from what I've seen here, I was able to get enough good parts out of three gearboxes to make one good one uh, of used parts. Now all my gears are good and all my, my, sh my shift dogs are good. All the metal components are good. The bushings are what uh, has, taken the, has taken the abuse here. Now, one thing you may or may not know is that a soft, bronze or brass bushing can wear out a hardened heat treated shaft and i'll tell you why and it doesn't make sense that one could wear that some soft metal could wear out a hard metal but what can happen is contaminants and and debris grit and other stuff can get into and embed itself into the bronze or softer metal and then all of a sudden it becomes sandpaper and then that sandpaper can wear your shaft out, a hardened sh shaft out. I've seen it many, many times over my lifetime. I've seen it where it looks like there was a, an area on a shaft, not on something like this, but on a shaft, where it looked like somebody machined a deep groove into it, right where that uh, bushing ran. And then you look at that bushing, and the bushing will have hardly any wear on it at all. But that's what happened. Dirt, grit, and other things get into it and will wear out that other shaft. N granted, inside this gearbox, there shouldn't be a lot of dirt and grit getting in there. Um, but one of the main reasons I do use Amsoil 75W90, and there again, I'm not sponsored by Amsoil. I just like to protect my stuff as best as possible because it's not cheap. Uh, this oil is not inexpensive at all, but I'll read, you, I'll read you on here exactly what it tells you. Delivers exceptional wear protection, even when contaminated up to 10% water. That's big, especially in something that's used in water. What I like about that on this and my Alpha 1 outdrive on my Mer Cruisers is if you do have seals that are starting to go bad and starting to let a little bit of water in there, and if you've ever pulled your plug out and had that little tablespoon or teaspoon of water come out first and then your oil comes out behind it, it means you got a bad seal. The good news is if you're using the right oil, 
it will have protected your gears and your bearings and your bushings and stuff like that because it still maintains its same lubricity with up to 10% water. Now, you cannot leave that water in there and expect it to do miracles. But at least that way, while it's under use, it's protected. And then the next time you change your gear oil, which I do every season, there's no reason not to. It's cheap insurance. So what I'm going to do with this particular gear drive here is I'm going to put it back on the boat. Back on the boat. I'm going to take it to the lake and I'm going to run it 18 mile round trip. I'll come back and I'll drain it again and see what that oil looks like. Now, if that oil comes out pretty much clear, it might have a little cloudiness in there due to the assembly lube I put in there. But if it comes out clear, that means I have fixed the problem and this, there's no more drag going on or bushing wear going on where it's just heating up and, and just tearing that oil up. As you saw in the beginning of the video, clear to jet black oil, that shouldn't have happened. Uh, but at least we did see what the culprit was and what happened and what caused the burning. And we have now resolved that in this gearbox. Well, folks, I hope that you found this informative and helpful. Uh, the links for some of the products I've been using uh, will be in the description below. You can follow those links. Most of them, I'll be honest with you, are going to Amazon because that's about the easiest place to get parts, pieces, and, just, and, and may not always be the cheapest, but it is always the most convenient. Uh, and actually, a lot of times it is the cheapest as well. I shouldn't say cheapest, the lesser expensive route to go. But uh, I'll leave all the links below. Don't be afraid to follow those links, buy what you need, buy exactly what I use in this video. And I'll also put my tools in there. The O-ring that I used around the, I did put a new O-ring on the outside of that one housing. Um, I'll leave the measurements and a link to that O-ring or an O-ring kit that contains that O-ring. Uh, so you can order the same thing. I've had O-ring kits here, a couple, two different types of O-ring kits here in my shop forever. Uh, you think that's something you just go through, go through. No, I've, I've had these O-rings for a long time. Um, but they're also, uh, I think the Buna rated, they're oil. They're, they're able to be used in oil without breaking down or, de or deteriorating in oil or grease and the like. So anyway, folks, get out there, have some fun. Don't be afraid to buy an old ta outboard and tackle it uh, and put it back together. You might have yourself a little diamond in the rough there and have something uh, that other people don't. It's really rewarding to take something like this 1969 motor, bring it back, use it, make it reliable, and catch some fish with it. Or just take your family out for a little putts around the lake. And in this case here, the putts in happens at about 22 miles an hour, which is awesome. Uh, you get, to get the boat up on plane and, and really enjoy it. Alrighty, well that's it. You guys get out there and have some fun. If it ain't broke, fix it till it is. This is Michael. And I'm out. Out, 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 out. He's out.